it, it seems strange, though, because a lot of people would say, well, look, the Saudis have the best oil reserves over there, don't they? I mean, aren't they the, the uh, you know, the Cadillac, if you will, of the guys who have that resource? But, uh, but as you point out, I, I think they have been misreporting, lying about what it is they have left, and it's time for expansion. Otherwise, they will begin to falter. They, they've been pumping it out at, at a high volume for quite a while. I mean, eventually, I think, <laughs> you know, there's going to be nothing left. And, and I've even been told that uh, they're getting very close to it now. The quality of what it is they're pulling up is not even that good. Uh, uh, from some of their major fields in Saudi Arabia. Now, I don't know what to believe because it's difficult to get information out of there that you can verify. Um, you know, what do you think about that? I mean, are we looking at a depletion situation where the Saudis, as a matter of their own economic survival, are doing this in Yemen? Or is there some other, some other motive here we don't see? It's economic survival trying to steal their neighbor's oil and gas reserves. It's very simple. Very, very simple. Now, the Gawar used to be the, the biggest oil field in the world, like, like for the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. But late in the 90s, it, it became different. Uh, in early 2000, they were pumping out over 90% water. So the percentage of oil in what they were pumping out was 10% or less oil. And, and I heard that around 2010, it was like 97% water. That's their biggest oil field. It's drained. It's, it's depleted. It's gone. The, the Saudis are having to rely. And this is a very, very strange phenomenon now. The Saudis are required now to rely on lots of smaller oil fields in the west near the Yemen border. And those are largely Shiite-controlled provinces in Saudi Arabia. So their dependence has moved away from the, 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 the giant, you know, like they call them elephants. Uh, uh, well, the elephant is now a bit of a dinosaur who's, that's weak, and their main production is near the Yemen border in Shiite territory. So this is, this is very tough. Um, the Saudis have been lying about their oil reserves for a very long time. Remember how we used to hear 10 years ago, well, the Saudis might put to use their spare capacity in order to bring down the oil price from the 120, 110, 105 level. They didn't have any spare capacity, but the news of their threat to open up the spare capacity, even like with a two-month lag, would bring down the oil price. So they, they used lies and propagandas about their oil reserve. So this is you know, very messy and Bring in the war, and it's just horrible, horrible. I think the Saudis are going to be in a, a very weird situation soon uh, where they're going to ask China to make a silly high bid on a portion of Aramco that would give the Saudis some money, make them flush with funds, but there might be a secondary purpose in there, and that would be to get the Saudis to agree to sell an RMB. Mm. Look at it this way. The Chinese buy, let's say, let's say they buy a, a hefty portion of what's offered in the IPO, and I'm hearing it like 20% of the whole thing or 20, 15% or 10% of the whole thing. Let's suppose that the Chinese buy half that. Well, that puts a lot of money in the Saudis' hands. It might be treasury bonds. This could be a way how... How uh, China gets rid of some more U.S. dollars. But it could come with the understanding that the Chinese can buy oil in the future from their partly owned Chinese Aramco in RMB terms. And this would undermine the petrodollar. So we might have Trump in Saudi land re regarding weapon sales, regarding oil cuts in output with the Russians and regarding the Aramco sale with China. And this is, oh boy, you know, some people think Syria is the focal point of a lot of conflict. I think it's Saudi Arabia. Well, it has to be. And what's interesting here is, it, it, you know, as you said, look, China holds so much of the U.S. treasuries. If they start to use it, it would kind of... Uh, 
be a, a bump for us in the U.S. economy briefly, right? If they start to actually sell off some of this stuff, I think, if they start to trade it. But if in the reciprocal fashion we end up with the, uh, you know, look, you're going to have to trade in the uh, in the gold back currency for oil, then uh, then really we're we're going to be in a lot of trouble as far as our dollar is concerned right away, because practically the only thing that's propped us up. Uh, in, in a lot of cases here during a lot of troublesome times has been the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, it was the supreme currency, the dollar. And what's weird here is that when, when you combine it with these arms deals and everything else, all this shuffling, you know, at the end, what are we looking at if, uh, if that's the direction it goes in? I mean, a much weaker dollar. Right, uh, a, a seriously uh, well deteriorated position for the U.S. in the in the region, okay, and it's all it all hinges on Saudi Arabia, so it kind of starts to make a little more sense. Uh, stick to the petrol dollar, or we'll kill you, <laughs> because if not, they're gonna they're gonna do a lot of damage here uh, if, if they engage in this uh, uh, to us to the U.S. Right? Yes, and and. If the Saudis receive a, a just a, a huge scad of treasure bonds for the Aramco sale, they're going to be in a position to pay for the weapons from the United States, but they're also going to be in a position to cover their deficits. So these are not going to be stored treasuries. They're going to be spent treasuries. It'll be more pressure, just like all the foreign central banks dumping treasure bonds, more pressure on the U.S. Department of Treasury, more pressure on the Fed to lap it up, and do more hidden QE. Anyone who thinks that the QE bond monetization going on at the Fed is, is only 40 to 50 billion a month, you got rocks in your head. It's 20 <laughs> times that. It's 20 times that. It's like a trillion dollars a month when you count the derivatives. Well, that's kind of a scary proposition. And when you talk about the central banks elsewhere, uh, this brings us into, well, let's just talk about the continent of Europe right away because all right, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the surface of it real fast. There was this whole thing between uh, Le Pen and Marcon, right? And uh, there were various financial considerations in there. It wasn't all about nationalism necessarily and the, uh, you know, the politics of politics, if you will. Uh, some of this was a financial consideration when it came to France. And I'm not sure what direction they're going to go in now. Uh, regarding their their monetization and how they're going to handle the EU, I guess they're going to stay. But uh, has everybody forgotten what's going on in Italy is what I wonder, because isn't that going to create a new uh, bit of pressure if, uh, if that continues to kind of lurch south as I think it's going to? Well, let me comment on France if I can. Yeah. Um. We just witnessed a significant crime scene in France. There were half a million extra Macron ballots handed out, and there were a half a million additional ballots without any voter on them that were all counted. That's a million. In addition, something like 60% of the Le Pen votes were destroyed and discarded. That's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So double the Macron vote and cut in half the Le Pen vote, and Macron wins! Oh, boy. Furthermore, something like 98% of the Muslims voted against Le Pen. So none of their votes were thrown away. Uh... We're going to, it's really kind of backwards. The, the winner is going to be, this winner, supposed winner for the rigged vote, this winner, Emmanuel Macron, is going to preside over a mess. A mess that Le Pen probably could not have handled. So, let this little preppy who had no political career five, six years ago, he came out of nowhere. He's a construct, he's an elite construct. He's uh, going to become a what they call a technocrat and put in a, a lot of supposed experts who aren't so political. But they're going to just preside over the decline of France. France is, is pretty much a messed up wrecked nation. 
I mean, Germany's got its problems, but it's not wrecked. They're, they're in a slight recession, but they're not wrecked. Their social fabric is getting severely tested by the Arab human garbage, but uh, the Arab human garbage has pretty much taken root in France for 20 years. That's not a new thing. Go to Marseille and you find pretty much a, an Arab village. Okay, back. let's move to Italy. Italy is in a very strange situation right now. Uh, the Euro Central Bank under Prince Draghi is cutting back on its bond purchases, while at the same time the Germans are selling their Italian bonds. And what's left is that the Italian banks are being obligated to soak up a lot of the Italian government bonds. A, a, a scary statistic is that in the last four years, the Euro Central Bank has bought almost 100% of the bonds that have financed the Italian government deficit. This is, uh, this is alarming. And any rate hike or pullback by the Germans and ECB, Euro Central Bank, any pullback uh, of their purchases would naturally try to force, I say try, to force up the interest rates uh, in Italy. While the ECB is not prob probably not going to be there to pick up the slack. So you might see a, a higher interest rate in Italy kind of as punishment for all their tough talk. Bring about a lot of bank failures finally. So Which are kinda, well, they're kind of overdue, failures. right? They're kind of overdue, yeah. though. Yeah, because it's six months. Yeah. Well, well, if you have the Germans selling Italian government bonds and you have the ECB pulling back on buying them, and, and the weak Italian banks are buying up what's being dumped by German and, and the ECB, you have a volatile situation where they're likely to see a higher interest rate from weaker hands holding the bonds and a weak economy that's stuck in a recession, and all you need is a couple bank failures in Italy, and uh-oh, look out. And that's what I expect to happen. So the ECB, the Euro Central Bank pullback, combining with the German sales, could be the pinprick for the Italian banks. And, you know, Germany's got its own problems. They're, they're being accused in the Italian banks of uh, racketeering and market rigging and falsified statements and fake accounts in the Italian courts, in the Italian legal system. The German banks and Deutsche Bank is being labeled a criminal organization in business, and this is not precedented.